Um, yes, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us all. Um, which is this? This will be the crikey. This is the fourth lunch and learn that we've done around apprenticeships that were launched during the NHS Project Futures Festival in February. Um, so thanks very much for for joining. I am sharing a, a, a very basic slide deck at the moment. I, can you can you see that? Um, yes. Great. It's very 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 small on a phone, but yes. All oh, right. OK, thanks, Eamon. Um, so, uh, yes, so this is the uh, the uh, lunch and learn around systems thinking, the practitioner apprenticeship uh, hosted by the University of uh, Bedfordshire. We have uh, Eamon Keenan, who's the head of CPD and short courses at the University of Bedfordshire. And we have John Rogers, who sat on the trailblazer committee for the um, level seven systems thinking standard. Um, so between the three of us, we're going to cover as much as we can in the time that we have. Um, and there's, there's been some real interest in this standard since since actually it's, it's taken a, and John perhaps may touch on it, but it's it's a standard that's taken an awful long time to to get through, uh, particularly at the endpoint assessment and other bits and pieces that's been part of this. And like any new standard that comes in, uh, that comes out, it, it takes a bit of time to get right. Um, there was an, a, a, an expressions of interest that was sent out during the festival in February, um, along with the other apprenticeship standards that were launched uh, by Navina Evans, who Dr. Navina Evans, who's our CEO at um, um, HE. Um, she was in within her hundred, first 100 days um, at HE and she launched the festival um, that week. And um, yeah, the, the, the standards themselves, there are, there are four that we've launched. Um, the one we, we're discussing today uh, is an MSC. Um, uh, believe it or not, was through the expressions of interest was the, the most popular of the four um, standards. Ah, oh, someone else is joining us now. Ah, oh, great. Um, so yeah, so um, given the, the 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 learning commitment that's required from an MSc, um, I, I was surprised by the the appetite for the standard. In some ways, and and in other ways, given the 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 systemic impacts um, COVID has had on the way the NHS has um, is has worked in that time. Actually, I can understand why people do have an interest in it uh, and perhaps thinking more about the the environment in which they work, the, the whether it's a project program or portfolio, how it interconnects into the wider system. Um, it, uh, you know, thinking of in that way, yes, I can understand why people would want to commit to the to the course. Um, so there are loads of benefits from from joining this program both uh to the individual and system-wide benefits and i i won't cover those and i, I will share this side uh slide deck following the presentation but um essentially to the individual capability and capacity to deliver things more more effectively um and understanding what those unintended unintended unintentional consequences are from things that you're delivering has on the system and as a system wide and thinking about HE as an organization within the system, how do we reduce negative impacts of change on the wider system and ensure that what we're doing it has a sustainable uh, implementation of positive change? So thinking about that, there's lots of benefits to, to taking part to the, uh, on this program. Um, there are ways you can get in touch with me and my colleagues, uh, most of which most of you here today have, have actually got in touch through our NHS Project Futures inbox. You can continue to do that that way. We do have a Twitter handle. We have LinkedIn, uh, which is a closed network group, which I will share um, when I hand over to John. Um, so you are welcome to, to, to take part in that. And that's open to anyone that is involved in project management, whether that is a primary or secondary profession in the NHS, you can join that and, and uh, meet uh, and network with other like-minded professionals. We do have a U YouTube channel and today's recording will be 
put on that YouTube channel so you can listen again um, or share with colleagues and uh, yeah, promote what we're doing. I, I think it's worth at this point just to mention that the expressions of interest is still available. We've had over 240 people uh, uh, reply to that, but we know uh, there are over 10, this is a conservative estimate, there are 10,000 people in the NHS working in a project program or portfolio capacity, um, whether that's a nurse delivering a service improvement plan or whether that's someone like me delivering an apprenticeship in the system, we, we have a commitment to um, broadening the messages that come out from this. So after today, if there's one thing you want to do um, is to connect with colleagues and share what we're doing so it gets out to a broader, more diverse um, range of people. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, you're welcome to put any questions in the chat. I know that might be difficult if the functionality isn't what it could be, but um, feel free to do that. As I said at the start of this, I'm joined by uh, John Rogers and Eamon Keenan. Um, I do have a copy of John's slides and I, before I hand over to John to introduce himself, I will just get that slide deck up. Um, which I have done. Could uh, could someone confirm that that slide deck is is viewable? It should have a systems thinking practitioner level seven apprenticeship on there with John's yeah. name. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, lovely. Looks Thanks good. very much. Uh, John Rogers, over to you. Thanks very much for for joining. Well, thanks uh, very much, Mike. Um, I'm relieved to hear that you can see my slides because I can't. <clears throat> so. Um, uh, as, as Mike said, I, I'm John Rogers, um, and I'm here as part of SIO. Um, what is SIO? We are a community of systems thinking practitioners. That's fundamentally what we are, um, of all ranges of experience. And uh, we are the UK professional body which welcomes practitioners from all schools of systems practice. There are others which focus on one or another, but SIO, uh, I won't say we'll take everybody, but um, yeah, yeah, we will. We're a very welcoming group. Um, uh, and SIO's members have been a huge contributor to the development of the standard. So that's a bit about SIO, which gives you some context. Um, Mike, if you'd go on to a bit about me, slide one. Yep, sure, John, um, yep. I, I, could, uh, I could talk to you with lots of jargon about systems thinking and all of that kind of stuff, but actually I, I tend to find it's helpful to make it a bit more grounded, a bit more real. So this is a bit about me. Um, I, I am a qualified dental surgeon, and I spent several years working in the NHS. I've also been a head of major dental development, head of change management uh, practice, and a program manager. And one of the recurring themes, actually, is that a lot of my roles have involved working across boundaries. Um, I joined local government in 2005 uh, and then became head of systems thinking at Wiltshire Council, where I was responsible for building a, a large systems thinking practice uh, over a decade, and we worked across the council, police and health partners. And, and as part of that, and, and Mike has been a victim of this, um, we developed and delivered an induction uh, program to 1,500 people to uh, introduce them to system thinking. Um, and then for three years, I was the chair of the Trailblazer Committee, which built this apprenticeship uh, and took it through all the three main stages of its creation. Mike, next slide, please. Sure, John, yeah. So more yeah. about me, I'm afraid. Um, and a, a lot about system thinking, people will probably talk to you about light bulb moments, turning points. Um, it, it, and they'll often use the metaphor of a learning journey one, one way or another. Um, I started in customer access and customer services. And some of the things I noticed there were we were really producing we were treating people as a, as a collection of arbitrary demand packets based on our professions, not as whole people. Uh, and I, we also noticed some quite disturbing generational patterns. We did a 42-year longitudinal study on one family, which threw up some very interesting recurrences. Um, uh, so that, that, was, that was an interesting turning point for me. Uh, in 2014, I did some work on the Better Care Program. Uh, the intermediate care system was my bit. Um, and what I concluded was that we had built a system which didn't seem to work properly for anybody, um, uh, and it was really hard to accomplish quite simple things. So uh, I, I would be hopeful that the integrated care systems give you an opportunity to address some of those, but I would also...
also saying, I think that you will need a good capability and system thinking practice to do it. And then in 2017, I, I met N. I didn't literally meet N. Uh, N, it, it, N became a case study. Uh, but that was a pivotal encounter that did change the way I looked at the world um, and, and thought about how we could create a better one, if you like. Um, uh, Mike, if you'd skip on to the slide marked case study. Yeah, sure, John, uh, yeah. This is a portion of an 11-year longitudinal case study for one individual, N. Um, and each of the columns represents a month and each of the boxes above the line in the column represents an interaction with an agency that we were able to access a record for. Um, if we go on to the next slide, this, by the way, it ran to about 10 feet long um, around a wall. We, we were able to access around about 1,100 recorded interactions in 11 years. And we reckon that because they didn't include NHS uh, and DWP and a few others, it was roughly half of that individual's interactions. Uh, that average is at round about four a week. And as you can see, children's services, housing, benefits, ambulance, hospital, primary health, mental health, police, and then a variety of other agencies. So a huge amount of work had been done with this individual. Um, and then, Mike, if you go on to the next slide, this is what we collectively achieved through this. Yeah, the synopsis was that, John. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so at the point at which we, 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 we ended our case study, um, this young woman was 27, so it was 26. She'd been statemented by the uh, local authority at age seven, so we knew her quite well. And this is our, uh, if you like, our collective, and of course the system is much wider than the authorities and it included her and her family and her other you know, friends, relationships and so on. But this is our collective this is our collective result. And it is only, of course, a snapshot of an individual. But it gives you a feel, if you like, for, for, this, for this person and for why it was so affecting. And then, Mike, if you'd move on. Yep, conclusions and learnings, John. Yep. So yep. my conclusions and learnings, if you like, from this, from this case and from my previous, you know, my, my, my previous practice, was that all of our combined public and voluntary sector system was producing these kinds of results for around one to 2,000 people in Wiltshire. Out of 500,000, but still one to 2,000 people. And it would continue to do so unless it was changed. So that was all our business cases, our process redesigns, our blueprinting, our programs and our restructures. We had built a system that did this. And it was a direct result of our worldviews and our thinking patterns. And then more of the same couldn't change it. Not just wouldn't change it, but it actually it couldn't change it. However, taking a systemic and collaborative learning and doing approach could change it. And, and then that, was take, that, that understanding was then taken forward in what became the LIFT program, which is a large, complex, cross-systemic program. Um, and what I want to go on to now is, is say, yes, the LIFT program was enormously complex. However, the same approach, the same way of looking at the world can be applied and followed all the way from a family unit or a team all the way up to an international questions. It's the same fundamental approach. Uh, the next two slides, uh, which are headed purpose and context and ST practitioner role orientation, uh, you can read those in the, in, in, in the standard. I recommend that you do have a dip into that to see what kinds of things are on there. And I want to just go on to my last slide, because um, some people have asked, you know, so what is systems thinking and, and, and what does it all mean and how does it all hang together? So I'm trying to distill that based on what I've just uh, walked you through. So systems thinking, and it's my version, is thinking systemically rather than systematically. It's a fundamental interest in the behavior of the whole rather than the behavior of any given element or elements of it. It's the way the whole works together. And, and that is the, that's the property known as emergence, which you may have come across. As an approach, it has been around forever. As a Western uh, management and academic discipline, it's been around for about 70 years. It has very extensive research. It's got a huge application base. It's completely robust. 
Um, it has, I think, three foundations, and I'm going to illustrate them with a, with a r rather trivial, hopefully mildly amusing um, analogy. So uh, in your homes, you've almost certainly got a boiler and a thermostat, which form your heating, a big part of your heating system. And they have a relationship, and it's a standard negative feedback loop. You'll be all be used to that, homeostasis and all that kind of stuff. So those are two things which are almost certainly fundamental to the operation of this system. And the relationship between them is the bit that you're focusing on. Um, the next part is boundary judgments. How do, you've got to decide which bits you're going to include within the boundary of your system because you can't look at everything or think about everything. So in, in my central heating system, I have a teenager. And the teenager comes downstairs. He's cold. He turns up the thermostat. Then he gets warm, and he doesn't turn down the thermostat. He opens the window. Thank you. So you've got <laughs> to decide, is the window important? Is the teenager important? What else in your boundary judgment are you going to decide is, is important and material to the behavior of this system? Which bits do you include and which don't you include? And that takes you on to the third foundation, which is this question of perspectives. Different people, and we will all have different perspectives on a system, the, those views are necessarily selective. They are partial in both senses of the word. And when we're thinking about a system and its purpose and the ethics behind that, you have to make choices about whose perspectives are well, the ones which are shaping the choice of elements, the understanding of the relationships, and the boundary that you're going to draw around the system in order to work with it and learn from it. These have significant ethical implications. And if we go back to the intermediate care system, for example, my work on that, a lot of it was about assessment rather than understanding and knowing. And that was a choice that the people in the system had made. Those kind of ethical implications had a, made a big difference to how that system worked for the people who were the beneficiaries of it. Now, these foundations aren't the whole story, but they're part of every single system thinking approach. No matter which one you look at, you will find them. And they're intended to help you towards making better sense of situations and creating better options for change. You will be very familiar with a systematic approach to decision making, which looks at the way elements of system function. Um, this systemic approach, the way of thinking about the whole, leads you to systematic as well, but it does not work in reverse. So in order to, be, to have a sufficient base of evidence and understanding for changing a system as a system, these are the skill sets that you'd need to develop. Now, as I want to close with, I wish I'd learned all that a long time ago. Um, I'm just delighted that you will be able to on this apprenticeship. And that's where I'll stop. Thanks, John. Um, I can definitely relate to the the uh, boiler thermostat um, system that you described. It's usually my wife that tells me that it's freezing and opens the windows. Um, but yeah, I can understand the uh, that and yeah. relate to it. So th thank you very much for that, John. You've done a terrific job given that you can't see your presentation at the moment. So thank you. Um, I suspect once this is shared, we're likely to have more we're, we're likely to have some comments, queries, or questions. So, um, um, we, we will sh share those with you, John, um, as and when they come in, if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. And and thanks very much. We 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 have ten minutes to go, and I thought we'd use the last few moments to to um, allow Eamon to present um, a little tell you a little bit more about the um, the university and he's got a, a short presentation that you can uh, you can all um, see on your screens at the moment. Um, that, Eamon? That's great thank you thank you very much Mike and, and thanks John for setting the scene so uh, so uh, you know uh, persuasively and, and interestingly. Um, just a little bit first of all about um, uh, the well, first of all, there's the, there's the title, Systems Thinking Practitioner. It's going to be delivered by the University of Bedfordshire with SIO as a, as a supporting provider, giving us the expertise we need to do that uh, effectively. Um, next slide, 
please, Mike, uh, very, very briefly. And these are phrases I've picked up from talking to John over the over the best part of the last year, really, that this apprenticeship in particular um, looks really exciting. It looks rewarding. You know, you'd expect uh, me to say that that kind of thing. But I genuinely believe that is the case, looking at the detail of the standard and the way Sire are approaching this. It's grounded and practical, as as John said. It is at postgraduate level, so it's challenging. Um, the program that SI are, are designing with us is comprehensive, so it covers all the relevant parts of the apprenticeship standard, the knowledge, the skills and the behaviours. And it is delivered by the UK's, we believe, leading experts in this field. And crucially, it involves provision of quite a lot of peer support from apprentices, from um, people passing through the through the apprenticeship. I'm going to say a little bit about the format of it, though, in just a second. Next slide, please, Mike. Uh, why University of Bedfordshire? Well, we feel we are an institution, uh, a university that really does know and understand the NHS, and I think that's quite important. We have an extensive record of teaching and research with NHS organisations. Currently, we have apprenticeship standards in place with 10 trusts for a variety of apprenticeship standards that you can see there, um, not just nursing and healthcare, but also senior leader and the uh, and project management as well. Um, so we are entering into the collaboration with SIO and provide that expertise in the design of the program and delivery We are a university. So there are quality standards and regulations that will ensure um, you have an experience of, of high standards of teaching. Um, we have a number of postgraduate level uh, apprenticeship training programmes going at the moment, including adva uh, uh, advanced clinical practice and senior leader. Um, and I just thought it was worth mentioning some of our clients, not just for apprenticeships, but also for wider uh, management training. And you can see them there. And we're very proud to be associated with so many household name clients. Um, next slide, please, Mike. If you're ready, next slide, please. Uh, yep, I'm showing that, Eamon. Perhaps uh, is there a, is it, how is the training delivered? Okay, you've got it. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, it's okay. No, I'm not Slight delay. You. Thank you. No, but, uh, <laughs> how is the training delivered? So, I mean, two main, two main things to say there that uh, the, the main vehicle for teaching is through workshops delivered by SIO consultants, and those will generally take place on a weekly basis, but they are uh, partnered, uh, complemented by learning sets where groups of up to around eight to ten apprentices would meet with a facilitator, um, another SIO uh, person, quite probably John, um, performing that role. And that enables those that small group to really reflect on and interpret uh, what's gone on in the workshops and make sure that it's, it's, it's grounded and applied to their own experience. Um, we do ask, we'll be requiring apprentices to write assignments and to basically prepare that portfolio of evidence that the ESFA require us to, um, to have in place for each apprentice to demonstrate that they've acquired the knowledge and the skills and the relevant behavioural practice in their workplace. <clears throat> so very close links between theory and experience um, and allowing apprentices to draw on the real issues that preoccupy them in their work context and to apply the, apply the knowledge and skills to that experience. Final slide, please, Mike. Thank you. Um, I, this is a 30 month uh, recommended duration, and that's what um, SIO and we have opted for. It's delivered in um, uh, what we would call um, quarters, so periods of 12 to 13 weeks and the first quarter of the programme providing an overview and a foundation for the remainder. There is flexibility to join the programme during that first year. So we will operate what we'd like to call a, a carousel approach where during that first year, new apprentices can join in um, and uh, have the same experience, not be disadvantaged, provided they're coming in within that initial 12 month period. Um, at the end of the 30 month period, there is, of course, the build up the gateway to endpoint assessment. 
and the principal vehicle for endpoint assessment is the is preparation of a, a report based on work carried out during the preceding 30 months so ensuring that the, you know the grounding and the practicality that john referred to um, what else can I say? We had a plan to begin the apprenticeship in September, October of 21, but um, we've had a conversation with Mike and made him aware of this. And we're now talking to a number of trusts who have approached us already. For reasons actually outside our control, we are likely to need to defer that initial presentation date until February 2022. And that's because there are strict rules set by the ESFA on how main providers like the university work with supporting providers like SIO. Um, and uh, those rules um, mean that we need longer to establish the correct kind of framework that the ESFA expects to see in pl place at the start of the apprenticeship. We're doing everything we can to move that along as quickly as possible. But for safety, we're now planning that that first cohort start would be in February 22. Um, Mike, I think I'll pause there. It's probably quite a lot of information, um, but but obviously I'm here now if um, if colleagues have questions they'd like to ask. Thanks, Eamon. That's that's great. And hopefully that's that's um, that's that's filled in some of the ac academic um, questions people perhaps had around how the training is delivered and the the level of involvement and support that that the university are able to offer for me i thought that was really interesting and uh whilst you have experience of delivering uh uh various apprenticeships to the nhs i think it's important to remind ourselves that getting exposure to other industries and other sectors is really really important and that we're bringing in fresh ideas, new ways of working and innovative solutions to problems that we we have in the NHS that we perhaps necessarily haven't haven't thought of and drawing lessons from that. So um, that, that's really interesting. And some of the clients that you've you've got um, um, uh, that you work with, um, I do I do recognize. So I think that's important for people to to understand that. Um, any questions from anyone on the there are questions that I've had in from people that were unable to make the session so I can go through a few of those but if there's anyone on the call that wants to chip in or raise a hand um, please feel free to do that um, Mike there's a few questions in the chat ah okay thank you Jenny yep thank you Um, yeah, so so Pam, I think um, she had a question about um, entry points on the apprenticeship. Um, are there confirmed entry points on the uh, on the apprenticeship, i.e., intake dates? So I think uh, Eamon's just just sort of described that. How frequently are the cohorts likely to be? Do you feel, Eamon? I know perhaps given that it's a new standard. Yeah. Uh, well, th th just coming back to Pam's question, just probably worth saying that we anticipate having those three start points in each year, subject to viability, subject to numbers. Um, but th with that initial start in February 22, we would then expect there to be further opportunities in that first 12 months in April of 2022, April or May, early May, and then a further opportunity in September, uh, stroke early October of 2022. Um, thereafter, uh, in terms of the, the, you know, the number of cohort starts, that really does depend almost entirely on the level of the level of demand. Mike, we are organising this so that we can accommodate both larger groups from a single employer, um, or if you like, composite groups, combined groups made up of. Uh, smaller numbers of apprentices from several organisations. So we're trying to make it as flexible as we possibly can. No, that's great. Thank you. I, I think going back to my point about the expressions of interest, be it that it's only a, uh, a small percentage of those that we know deliver project program projects, programmes and portfolios, we do know there's, there's appetite. So um, what is the cost attached to, to the programme? The, the 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 cost is, as as you I, I think you'll be fairly uh, clued up on this, Mike, is that it, it 
there is no cost to the individual. The mm. um, the the program for organised sorts of NHS organisations we're talking about will be levy payers. So mm -hmm. the the cost of the, tr the training and assessment will be met through the employer's apprenticeship levy, um, and the uh, overall figure that over the thirty months plus EPA, the overall cost to the employer will be uh, not more than eighteen thousand pounds, which is the um, fun so-called funding band limit set by the ESFA. Um, there may there may be providers around the UK, maybe a small number who are also looking at systems thinking practitioner uh, apprenticeship who may charge more but any additional sum would have to come in cash from come in cash from the employer we've set a limit of 18000 pounds so that there will be no additional contribution required from employers very thorough thank you Eamon. that's great it's worth mentioning uh, just to supplement that that the cost of the levy payment is uh, available to view on our um documents the nhs project futures documents so i will be sending those on because i know that this this call is for both people that are interested in in actually going on the learning course as well as those that are have a decision making capacity in each of their organizations so i'll be i'll be sending that on and hopefully that'll be that'll be clear um louise has a question about the application process Eamon. um are you able to sort of describe what that looks like and what the lead time is likely to be on applications right um that, that, that's a, a you know a, a very uh, good practical question um we would normally suggest that there should be a minimum of eight to ten weeks between the point of submitting an application for the program and the and the program start um the esfa i mean it's th th what happens in those eight to ten weeks is a combination of requirements set by the ESFA for all apprenticeships and then the university's own normal application processes for you know assessing applications uh, from individuals. So the ESFA requires that during that interval we engage with a prospective apprentice, we just check their eligibility and um, you know I don't envisage uh, issues of, of any kind in the way that we're working with Health Education England so it's highly likely that those would be fairly routine checks um, but they do also require us to conduct something they call a, um, a skills gap analysis at the outset which first of all confirms that the apprenticeship is an appropriate apprenticeship for that individual and again we would be relying on uh, working very closely with um, HEE and other NHS colleagues to, to just confirm that fact and then looking at that individual's previous qualifications and, ex and employment history um, we, do, we are obliged to conduct an assessment and to consider whether uh, an individual's previous employment or qualifications should actually exempt them from any part of the apprenticeship program because um, the ESFA does not want public money as it sees it, uh, the, the employer's levy going to pay for training that somebody's already had, you know, that's, that would be wastage. So uh, we do conduct that skills gap analysis. We sometimes have to carefully consider previous qualifications uh, that may have been conducted, may have been uh, obtained outside the UK or the EU. And so there is a certain um, you know, level of detail that we need to go through there. We also, for apprenticeships at this level, in fact, for anything above a level three apprenticeship, have to check that um, uh, a potential prospective apprentice has uh, qualifications in English and maths that meet requirements of the ESFA and I won't go into all the detail there. Generally it's fairly routine but it can involve a bit more digging uh, in support of some applications uh, and working with the apprentice to do that. So quite a lot of things that need to be done. Um, we work with employers to ensure that the entry qualifications, the ent entry requirements um, heavily reflect the, the reality of the skills that somebody has. So we're not just interested in paper qualifications, we're really also interested in a person's capability as demonstrated through their work, uh, work practice, work experience. I hope that's reasonably helpful. Very thorough. Thanks, Eamon. That's, that's excellent. And just to sort of supplement that, um, the question from Louise, what the application process looks like. I, I, I'll be linked to, I am already 
been I've been linking to Eamon and John as often as we can, along with the HE apprenticeship leads, of which your organisations should be linked to. Um, you, you'll have an apprenticeship lead in each of your organisations that has a, a responsibility um, to um, uh, implement, procure and um, carry out apprenticeships. So I would suggest certainly having a chat with your manager, line manager in the first instance to say, I've come here today, um, I've heard what John and Eamon have had to say, this is for me, I'm, I'm absolutely committed, I think this is what we'll gain from going on the apprenticeship, both personally and in the directory that you work, and, and get their support on what you want to do, and then link that back to your apprenticeship lead, and, and they can then advise you on the levy arrangements, and I would then link to me around um, your intent to apply, and I can link that to Eamon and be their sort of conduit between their their um, application process and the things that Eamon's described, as well as um, what the capacity is available uh, currently on those. Um, and you can reach me on the NHS Project Futures inbox, and it's on this slide deck that I shared earlier. And I'll I'll send that round so you know who how to get uh, how to get hold of me. We are running out of time, but just just before we do sort of close, I just want to pick up one final kind of question, if that's possible. Um, is there any expectations to to attend physically at the university? And and could you talk a little bit about if someone has got commitments at, at work, if these sessions can be done at evening times, or what's the flexibility on that, Eamon, please? Okay, okay. Well, it, yeah, it probably won't surprise you to learn that over the last year, we've learned quite a lot about flexibility. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we've moved virtually all of our teaching and learning uh, from in-person, you know, classroom um, thinking on to, uh, to online delivery. So um, the, uh, some of this will depend on the expectations and requirements of an individual employer. Um, and so we can try and accommodate those as far as humanly possible. The great majority of teaching and learning would be delivered online. Um, if an employer thinks there will be value in some in-person events um, for apprentices to get to network, possibly to network with other employers, apprentices, we will build those in. But we will make sure that the great majority of training delivery, learning delivery is remote and online to, to accommodate just that kind of flexibility you've mentioned, John. Um, all teaching sessions online are recorded. We've been building up that, that practice over the past year. So for those who are unable to attend um, a, particular, a particular live teaching event, they will be able to view the recording and they will have access to um, a key member of staff we call an apprenticeship coordinator who will either be uh, from SIO itself or one of our experienced coordinators who will provide support and guidance in those circumstances. Fantastic. And just to supplement Eamon's sort of response there, we purposely picked out providers that can, um, you know, are willing and have the capacity to deliver it online and that there is flexibility built in to the system. So, yeah, absolutely. And uh, we, we picked two uh, to deliver this standard, University of Bedford, Bedfordshire being one and JGE being another. But they are, um, given that this is a new standard, um, there wasn't any historical data to go on uh, aligned to that standard. But certainly the procurement that we carried out was very thorough and uh, these are the best of what's available and best that, the best that's out there. So um, just to sort of provide some reassurance there. Um, so thanks very much. We, 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 unless anyone's got a burning question, uh, Jenny? Hi, Mike. Sorry, it's not a burning question. I'm just a bit worried about a couple of the questions in the chat. I just want to address it. Um, Justina's mentioned about, you know, this evening, majority of work in the evening. One of the most important things that you need to remember is this is an apprenticeship. So it's 20% off the job and they have to be given a minimum of 20% of working time to contribute towards this course mm -hmm. um so you know that is something that has to be factored in um, as i say it's a minimum of 20 percent. so there may be working there may be that you do do stuff in the evening of course there is you know it's 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 a 
a master's level course. It's not going to be something that you can do one day a week um, in, in that sense. But you do have to allow staff that time in working hours to complete the apprenticeship. Really important. Um, and Eamon and the team um, at the university and AG sorry G A uh, oh J G A yeah, a... um, will will have to um uh, record that and monitor it because they will be audited so um you know it's public money it's a tax and it has to it all has to be accounted for the second question um i just want to pick up quickly faith has mentioned you know do all nhs organizations have access to the levy um most large lev uh, most large NHS trusts um, across the country pay an apprenticeship levy, so you need to speak to your apprenticeship lead in the trust to see um, how much is in the pot and, and you know and see if this is available. The eighteen thousand, um, if it is a CCG as Faith has come from, um, I can see is it Lewisham, so it's one of my CCGs. Um, highly likely that the CCG do pay a levy it may be quite small so I can help with a levy transfer if that's something so we offer a levy transfer matchmaking service at Health Education England so happy to be contacted about that if that's needed thanks Mike no that's brilliant thanks very much Jenny I saw those and I was thinking of you um <laughs> when I saw those those come in so thanks very much and as Jenny described um there are uh, counterparts um like Jenny um who are the the who support and advise and provide that strategic uh, um, input? So um, I will. It's in my sl slide deck. A little link to those people, and it tells you which region they're responsible for and how to get in touch. So I'll I'll be sharing those too. Um, so thanks very much for everyone. Uh, hi, I know it's bit... Caroline from UCLH. I'm really sorry. Oh, hi, Caroline. My chat function isn't working. And no, feel uh, free I... to say your bit. Thank I've seen you. you. You've been dipping in and out. You've been that's doing, right yeah you've been doing well getting <laughs> <laughs> i just wanted to clarify yeah. um the target group for this program i'm sorry if you've covered it already um but as you say i've been dipping in and out <laughs> it's been chucking me in and out so yeah just some clarification about who is this um program aimed at shall i talk about the standard a bit uh, that'd be um, useful. Thank you, yeah, John. The, the standard uh, is uh, equally applicable um, in different ways, but equally applicable either for people who are what you might term change professionals, so uh, working in the change and improvement arena, or for people who have their sights on senior management. It is, uh, it, it's an if you like, it is an alternative to an MBA, uh, and, and it, it, is, it is useful and usable and relevant to both those kinds of people. Um, and on the topic of relevance, what I would say is our goal and intention is it's relevant from the first day all the way through. So it's always applicable and it's always relevant in your work if you're in one of those two, um, one of those two categories. Thank you. And what's the qualification that they will um, achieve at the end? They achieve uh, uh, the Systems Thinking Practitioner Apprenticeship Level 7 qualification. That's the, it, it, the apprenticeship is the qualification. Okay. In addition to which, uh, they, uh, the apprentices that, that complete the, um, the course are also uh, eligible for uh, advanced practitioner certification from SIO. Uh, Eamon, do you want to comment on the, uh, on the, on yeah. the academic side of things? The, the, way, the way this is shaping up, thanks John, the way this is shaping up is that um, the university is uh, going through the process of, of approving the academic you know, details of the program on the basis that it will count um, for 120 credits at postgraduate level towards uh, a master's degree. Now, the master's degree requires 180 credits, so the com successful completion of this apprenticeship would count for 120 of those 180. Um, it would provide successful apprentices with the option to um, conduct to go through a single unit uh, as we call a course unit or module worth those 60 credits largely based on research and uh, writing up that research project um, which would then give them the full credit value of the master's de master's degree so that's what we're uh, that's what we're actually preparing for at the present to be able to recognise, you know, the, the achievement of the apprenticeship academically towards a master's degree. 
OK, and if they wanted to undertake the further 60 credits, um, how much would that cost? Right, OK, well, you, you've put me slightly on the spot because I don't <laughs> I don't have the excuse me. I don't have the approved fee levels for September onwards mm -hmm. in, you know, next year on, in my head. Um, but that you're right to say there would be a fee. It would be the uh, fee we would charge to part time master's level students. Um, if it's helpful, Mike, I can establish that and and get you that information. Uh, rather than hazard a guess at uh, next year's fee levels. Yeah, that would be useful, I mean, as and when that, that starts to clear and you know a little bit more about that, that would be really useful. And, and I think today, what today's shown me is uh, that there's uh, there's lots of questions and we haven't got round to getting, getting through them all. So perhaps this is one of others that we might do to build on people's awareness and uh, understanding of the apprenticeship and uh, the work that you're doing to to deliver it. So perhaps we can look to do more of this um, and maybe maybe split it up by region, maybe do uh, one region uh, and, and go around it like a little roadshow. I, I don't know. I'll just invite everyone in and do it that way. But um, feel free to put your questions to me on the in the NHS Project Futures um, inbox. Um, I'll do my best to um, put those to um, the team um, and I'll just put it in the chat now so you know where to direct your queries and um, feel free to do that and I'll I'll be you know happy to coordinate responses around that so thanks very much um, I'll, I'll share the recording and everything else um, that we've we've covered during today's session and uh, big thanks to Eamon um, busy guy big thanks to John as well very busy and ev everyone else that's added go on John I just say my pleasure yeah, indeed. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mine too. No, it's, uh, it's good to have you on board and uh, hopefully today has shown you that people are um, very keen to, to find out more and, and, and start this, this journey. So um, thanks for sharing what you've uh, shown today yeah. and uh, thanks for everyone that's, that's made the effort because I know Teams has played up a bit. But um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot and okay. have, have lovely yeah. afternoons. Bye bye.